Good afternoon. As we head into the holiday weekend, I wanted to give you an update on the surge of COVID-19 cases in Oregon. I'm joined virtually by uh, Director of the Oregon Health Authority, Pat Allen, Dr. Dean Seidlinger, our state epidemiologist, and Dr. David Zonis, Associate Chief Medical Officer at the Oregon Health and Science University. Thanksgiving weekend is here. It's a time of year many of us cherish, myself included. And yet, as we enter month 10 of what feels like a never ending pandemic, it's hard not to mourn the loss of large holiday celebrations and dinners with family and friends. But here we are. Just today, we have more than 1,100 new cases and sadly, 20 deaths. We now find ourselves in an even more difficult place than we were back in March when COVID-19 first emerged in Oregon. In the spring, much was unknown about the virus. We weren't sure if we had enough PPE to protect our doctors and nurses, and we didn't fully understand how to prevent its spread. Today, we know so much more. However, we also face the reality that COVID-19 is rampant in our communities. It is rampant across the entire state of Oregon. And we're all tired. Tired of not being able to see our friends and teachers at school. Tired of missing loved ones we can't see in order to protect them. Tired of staying up late, worrying about bills or rent or the family business. Aspects of the pandemic that were novel in the spring, like learning how to bake bread or having a virtual happy hour with your, our friends are certainly wearing on all of us, especially with the holidays, which are about sharing a meal and being together. COVID fatigue is a real thing. It's certainly been a long year and one that has been exceptionally challenging for Oregonians. Not only have we been dealing with this pandemic, we also suffered through a heartbreaking and historic wildfire season. So many families have lost so much this year. Unfortunately, now more than ever is the time we must double down on our efforts to stop COVID from spreading. Let me tell you why. First, the situation is extremely dire. Our hospitals are stretched and Oregonians are dying. That may not mean as much to you if you haven't experienced the virus firsthand, but I don't want your experience with COVID to be do losing someone you love or you yourself being turned away from a hospital when you need medical care. Not everyone dies from COVID-19, that's true. But trust me, this is not a virus you want to get. Even young people's lives can be devastated by the virus. We continue to learn more about the long-term impacts of the disease, extreme tiredness and fatigue, loss of taste and smell, permanent lung damage. One of the most difficult aspects of COVID-19 is that your choices impact others. We saw this a several months ago when 65 people who made the decision to attend an indoor wedding in Maine. Those decisions led to 176 cases of COVID and seven deaths. The most tragic thing about this is that the seven people who died didn't even attend the wedding, yet they still lost their lives. When people don't respect how serious the virus is and when they act against the recommendations of doctors and public health experts, not only are they putting themselves at risk, they're putting all of us at risk. I promise you, this isn't forever, it's just for now. By making sacrifices these holidays to protect our friends and families, we can make sure no one is missing when we gather around our dining room tables next year. Making smart choices now to wear a mask, to limit our social gatherings, to stay home when sick. These choices will get us out of this horrible situation faster and smart choices bring us closer to normal life, closer to reopening our businesses 
and keeping them open, closer to getting our kids back in the classroom and staying there. I don't know about you, but the thought of returning to life as we remember it before COVID is very motivating to me. So with that, I will say this, please, please make smart choices this holiday weekend that will protect you, your family, and your neighbors. Irresponsible behavior over Thanksgiving, at best, will only make the pandemic last longer. At worst, it will send one of your loved ones to the ICU. The statewide two-week freeze is complete next week. However, due to extensive COVID-19 spread in our communities, there are at least 21 counties, including our most populous counties like Multnomah, that are facing extreme risk of virus spread and will need to continue with strict health and safety measures similar to the freeze through most of December. My hope is that Oregonians in these counties take this news seriously and commit to hunkering down for the next several weeks. For all counties in Oregon, we are introducing a data-driven framework intended to protect Oregonians by putting appropriate safety measures in place dependent on a county's risk to the disease, ranging from low risk to extreme risk. It's important to note here that there is a not a no risk category. Un, until our COVID-19 vaccines are widely available, health and safety precautions will remain in place so that our schools, our businesses, and our communities can reopen and stay open. So before I turn it over to Dr. Seidlinger to share details of the new framework, I wanna say this, thank you. Thank you to every single Oregonian that continues to do the right thing by taking the appropriate safety precautions. I know it's hard and you are sacrificing a lot. I sincerely hope that sacrifices this holiday season will be rewarded with stories shared over dinner tables next holiday season about how happy we are that both 2020 and COVID are over. Let's keep each other safe. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Seidlinger. Thank you very much, Governor Brown. I want to say a few words about the state of the virus here in Oregon. I know that the current increase in cases has affected many of you directly, and others are anxious about coming down with COVID-19. And my thoughts are with all Oregonians as we battle this virus together. On Friday, we reported that COVID-19 was spreading dangerously in Oregon and that the pandemic is at a dire point. Over the past two weekend days, we set new records for daily cases and have since reported over a thousand additional cases each of the past three days. Today, we're reporting 1,189 new cases and tragically, 20 more deaths. We are also seeing severely ill COVID-19 patients filling hospital beds at an alarming rate, the highest numbers since this pandemic began. We have had more than a tripling of our COVID-19 hospitalizations since the end of October. And unless we can get the virus under control, we face the looming threat of inundating our hospitals with severely ill patients, and that can put more lives at risk. So now let's turn our attention to the new protective measures that Governor Brown has announced today. These new tools are rooted in science and will enable us to focus our efforts where the disease is most prevalent, and they will go into effect after the freeze on December 3rd. The guidelines will evaluate the spread of the virus across Oregon by studying case rates and positive test rates, by closely monitoring hospital capacity, and by closely examining the impacts of COVID-19. The guidelines will include steps that we can all take to lessen our chances of becoming infected favoring outdoor activities over indoor activities, wearing a mask outside our household, and sometimes even within our household to protect those most vulnerable, staying at least six feet away from others, limiting our close contacts to members of our household and avoiding prolonged contact with others. And lastly, avoiding crowded spaces, both indoors and outdoors. We will adapt and simplify our public health indicators 
and set appropriate risk levels for counties based on that criteria, which we will update weekly. The data we will look at is a calculation of the COVID-19 rate per 100,000 over a two-week period in large counties and for smaller counties, looking at their number of COVID-19 cases. We will also look at the rate of positive tests over the two-week period on a scale from minimal to widespread, and we'll do that in all but the smallest counties. We'll continue to monitor other um, data, such as people seeking care in the emergency department for COVID-like illness, newly admitted patients to the hospital, outbreaks reported in congregate um, care facility, and our public health response. Recommended activities will be assessed by the risk potential for spreading COVID-19, with more activities being permitted in counties at lower risk of COVID-19 and fewer activities, or even some prohibitions in counties considered to be at extreme risk. The recommended protections are informed by the current science and from successful steps we have taken to date here in Oregon, ranging from limitations on indoor seating at bars and restaurants because we know that these are venues where people spend time without masks, eating and drinking, to rolling back indoor gym visits and indoor recreational sports because exercising people breathe more heavily and produce more droplets. Their face coverings when they become damp with sweat are not as effective for stopping the infection. Restricting the size of indoor gatherings among multiple households, encouraging remote work whenever possible. We believe that by implementing this framework, it will enable us to better manage the impacts of COVID-19 through the winter until we can defeat the pandemic through emerging therapeutics and hopefully soon availability of proven vaccines. And finally, as we approach Thanksgiving, let's think hard about how we celebrate the holiday this year to keep our loved ones safe and healthy. We've seen increased cases after many holidays since the state reopened. So let's make Thanksgiving a notable exception. As I talk about Thanksgiving, let me start with a thank you to all of you Oregonians who have changed your plans, limited your gatherings, and plan to celebrate smaller. Thank you. For others, I encourage you to join the move to a smaller gathering for your safety, as well as the safety of your loved ones and neighbors. But I know this is hard. Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays. I think I get this from my mom who it was her absolute favorite holiday. When she was sick, um, my sisters and I would take turns visiting her in Florida as she refused to come visit any of us where it was cold and she might have to see snow again. And nine years ago, when my mom was sick, we determined we would all come down and celebrate one last Thanksgiving with my mom. Unfortunately, she passed away the day before we got there. But we did what we always do. We got together, we told stories, we laughed. We cried more that year because my mother was gone, but mostly we cherished the memories that we had with her over our lifetime. And we looked forward to the future of continuing those traditions. And this year, that tradition looks very different. For me, I, I suffered the loss of a brother and one of my brother-in-laws this year. And so I was really looking forward to this time with my extended family. Um, to tell stories, to share memories, to laugh and to cry. But I don't have that this year. I live um, with my mother-in-law. She's um, elderly. She has underlying medical conditions. And I don't want to be the person responsible for potentially exposing her to COVID-19 at a big holiday party. So we're celebrating small. We're celebrating using technology. And we're looking forward to next year when the holiday won't look like it does this year. So what are some other steps that you can do? If you have kids coming home from college, you know, that didn't take steps to quarantine before they return from campus, they should try and avoid contact with people outside the household for at least 14 days. They could consider getting tested, but a test is not a free pass to resume our activities. For the rest of us, let's stay home and keep our holiday celebrations to six or fewer across not more than two households. Let's visit our out-of-town relatives virtually this year. Let's wear a mask. Let's keep physically distanced. And let's think how we celebrate holidays for the rest of this year. So next year, we can all gather together safely. So have a safe and happy Thanksgiving holiday. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Director Allen. Thank you, Dr. Seidlinger. The governor described the new framework 
the COVID-19 protections we're putting in place. And Dr. Seidlinger has provided some of the medical science that undergirds the preventive measures we've implemented across a range of activities linked to COVID-19 transmission when counties are facing different levels of risk. What I'd like to take a couple of minutes to talk about is the necessary balance these protections strike between precaution and pragmatism. Oregonians will never leave each other to fend for themselves during any crisis, especially a pandemic. We will never be a state that puts a dollar value on the life of a grandmother adored by her family, a breadwinning father with diabetes or an exhausted nurse working overtime in an intensive care unit and say, it's too expensive, intrusive or inconvenient to ask your neighbors to protect you. And watching out for each other also means we recognize that human health is full and complex in its dimensions. We know that there are many casualties of COVID-19 among people who've never contracted the virus. While they aren't documented in our infection and testing rates, the virus has harmed them too. It's stolen their livelihoods, their homes, or their emotional well-being without ever having attacked their bodies. Their losses matter. We'll never be a state that takes a narrow view of health and refuses to take their experience into account either. At the Oregon Health Authority, we're paying attention to, to the collateral effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact on behavioral health, indicators of toxic stress, barriers to medical care, economic underpinnings of health, and other measures of health and stability in people's lives. Looking at the data, you won't be surprised to hear that COVID-19 has had damaging effects beyond the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Let's start with behavioral health. In mid-July, nearly 50% of adult Oregonians experienced symptoms of depression and anxiety, according to a new monthly household survey conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That percentage tapered off in the early fall, but has begun to rise again. Substance use is another indicator of well-being. In March, as the pandemic took hold, cannabis sales spiked almost 40%, from monthly sales of $70 million to nearly $110 million. Consumer sales at liquor stores almost doubled, jumping from more than $35 million a month in March to more than $65 million a month by June. Access to care has been impacted. In April, nearly six in 10 Oregonians delayed or did not receive medical care for at least four weeks. By October, that number had dropped to four in 10, but that's still an indication of major barriers to care. And that number is likely to rise again as hospitals fill with COVID-19 patients. Finally, economic stability. We've pulled data from 211 Info, which is a nonprofit call center that provides people with referrals for basic needs programs. Compared to last year, the number of calls asking for help has nearly doubled, and it spiked from about 14,000 monthly calls to more than 25,000 contacts between February 2020 and March 2020. Housing's a major concern. Requests for help with housing problems have more than doubled rising from about 4,000 calls a month in February to nearly 9,000 calls in August. And requests for help with food insecurity, utility assistance, and other issues also rose. Between February and August, calls seeking help with food tripled from about 1,000 calls a month to about 3,000 calls. Now, some people may hear these data as proof points for why we should abandon any collective responsibility to protect each other, even if it means temporarily curtailing some normal activities or rethinking cherished traditions like a large Thanksgiving dinner, but nothing could be further from the truth. The hard reality is this, there is no normal while the virus rages unchecked and the touch points of daily life, going shopping, having dinner out with your friends, working out could make you sick. There is no healthy economy while COVID-19 circulates widely in public places. A large majority of Oregonians are very or somewhat worried about catching COVID-19. Even before the freeze, most Oregonians reported having cut back on eating out and other public activities. A healthy community is necessary for a healthy economy. You can't have a fully functional economy while people are reluctant to be around each other. There is no choice but to con contain COVID-19 through common sense, science-based measures like the ones Governor Brown and Dr. Seidlinger described. The framework we've announced today strikes the necessary balance between precaution and pragmatism. It recognizes the social, emotional, and material, material health are intertwined with physical health. It calibrates the protective measures we need to put in place in each county based on local risks. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It gives communities control over their own destiny. It provides more flexibility when counties succeed in working together to drive down infection rates in their own communities. One last point. 
These protections are not forever. In December, Oregon expects to begin receiving limited shipments of the first COVID-19 vaccine. While we're still awaiting federal emergency use authorization, these vaccines appear to be safe and effective. That's good news. If we all get vaccinated, we can put an end to this pandemic. We will prioritize the first doses of front, uh, for frontline healthcare workers. Then as we receive more shipments, we'll expand eligibility to vulnerable populations like nursing home residents, people with developmental disabilities, essential workers, and then to the wider population. In Oregon, health experts won't make decisions about who gets the vaccine first on our own. We will consult a diverse range of voices. We'll look at these questions through an equity framework. We'll seek out and listen to leaders from communities that have been hardest hit by COVID-19 and also have the greatest distrust of healthcare systems after generations of health inequity, including systemic racism and even shameful experimentation. While the arrival, arrival of vaccines puts the end of COVID-19 in sight, it also reminds us that decisions we make today are urgent and unavoidable. Every COVID death is preventable. Let's not lose any more lives, especially now as vaccines become a reality, not a hope. We know simple steps work to stop the virus from spreading. Wear a mask, keep social gatherings small and limit the number of people you see from other households. Thank you and with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. David Zonis. Thank you, D Director Allen and thank you Governor Brown for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is David Zonis and I'm the medical director for our intensive care units at OHSU. I'm also a trauma surgeon and a colonel in the US Air Force, and I've been on the front lines of war in Afghanistan for American patriots who really put themselves in harm's way, but they only did it as a necessary and calculated risk. They always looked out for each other, and they always expected a medical system to be ready and capable should they get sick or injured. I'm really proud of my 21 years of continued service, but the last thing that I expected was to now be on another front line of war against a virus that is very real and is a very large threat to our fellow Oregonians. No one has unlimited resources and our health systems are being stressed by a virus that is deadly as it is preventable. And that's why I'm here today, to share with you what we're already seeing and what we're already doing in our intensive care units and to urge people to remain vigilant, think about the health of your friends, your family, and please stay home for the holidays this year. There's absolutely no doubt that our ask is a hard one but I wanna ask for your sacrifice so that we can assure that we are capable of providing the care for those who need it. We're asking people to make smart choices today, to hunker down this year so that many hundreds or even thousands of Oregon families can experience the joy of gathering with your friends and families for future holidays. We're already seeing hospitalizations rise substantially at OHSU over just the past three weeks. Even though we've learned a lot about treating COVID since the spring, I can tell you that no one wants to end up in an intensive care unit. As much as I love to take care of patients, I'm usually the last person that anyone wants to see. Despite the compassion and the high quality care that our doctors and nurses are providing, patients remain isolated, often on ventilators and away from their friends and family. Among those who do survive, it can take months to recover. And sadly, for those who are dying, they do so in relative isolation from those who care about them the most. Now, even today, I meet with people in our ICUs who didn't think that COVID was either real or was going to be as bad as they heard that it could be. And every time, without failure, they are critically ill and their families are remorseful. They say, you know, I really wish I had taken this more seriously. Well, please take it seriously because the misinformation and the misunderstanding of this disease will lead to additional spread, more illness, and really unnecessary anguish. You know, Thanksgiving is the perfect storm of risk factors that can land a patient in our intensive care unit time and time again. Lots of people, different age groups, including vulnerable, vulnerable um, older people, being indoors with minimal ventilation thanks to our cool and wet climate, being crowded close together, and obviously no masks for the majority of the time because they're eating and drinking. And this is exactly the scenario that this virus can thrive on. We know the virus is circulating widely in Oregon, and any large group with multiple households, simple arithmetic tells us that some of you will ultimately end up in our hospital and in, the, in our intensive care units. 
As healthcare workers, we all took a solemn vow to step up and provide the care for all of those people who need it. For these past several months, it has been physically and emotionally exhausting. In many cases, healthcare workers have been the only human contact for people struggling to survive without the benefit of a face-to-face -face contact with their loved ones. And this is truly heartbreaking. Even in the midst of this pandemic, our frontline staff will still be there for you, but we are asking for you to help us. Please hold out just a little longer until the vaccines are on their way. Please be a patriot. Please make smart decisions. Please mask up, maintain a safe distance, practice hand hygiene, and please stay at home. Thank you. We are now ready for questions. Thank you, Governor. Uh, this is Charles Boyle in the governor's office. Um, for re the reporters on the line, please use the raise your hand function to get into the question queue and we'll unmute your line. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. I know folks have been trying to record the call. We will send a high definition recording to folks after the call is complete so that you can use that for your purposes. Um, first question will go to uh, Wright Gazaway with K2. Go ahead, Wright. Uh Thank you, Governor. I just wanted to confirm that this new guidance does allow uh, outdoor dining, uh, even in Multnomah County. And if that's true, what inspired you to change your mind here? Thank you. Um, my goal as Oregon's governor is to protect the health and safety of Oregonians. And we are going to continue to make decisions based on science and data. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today, obviously, is to encourage Oregonians to keep their holiday gatherings small, which I know is challenging. Um, in terms of the new metrics, uh, yes, um, in the extreme risk category, uh, the uh, allows for a limited amount of outdoor dining. Uh, and I'll let Dr. Seidlinger talk about uh, the science and data behind that. Thank you, Governor Brown, and thank you, Wright, for the question. I think, you know, um, in looking at, at all of these decisions about which um, sectors kind of led to transmission, we examined many points of evidence. When we talk about restaurants and bars, this is places where people go to eat and drink. So by definition, their masks come off. When we talk about going out to bars and restaurants with our friends and loved ones, we sit. Um, within six feet of those who aren't in our household, unless we're going out to eat together with just the people from our house. So those things promote um, transmission of this virus. Um, moving those activities outdoors can certainly reduce the risk. But during the freeze, with cases rising significantly across the state, the decision was made to move restaurants to takeout delivery only. As we move forward, knowing that these parameters we're putting in place will be with us through the winter to help us live with this virus until we have the vaccine to protect us. We looked at the risk and said, okay, what can we do in bars and restaurants to lower risk? We still encourage you to patronize those um, places of business, um, take delivery, take takeout, especially if you're from a vulnerable population or wanting to share a meal or a drink with someone from a vulnerable population. But if you need to go out, the option for some limited outdoor seating and smaller parties is available but know that it doesn't come without risk. None of the decisions we make when we leave our house to go to work, to go to the store, um, to go out to eat come without risk. Um, so we assess those risks versus the benefits to our kind of emotional state, our mental health, to the economy. We take those seriously. And we hope people will consider those risks as they make decisions. We'll consider supporting those um, businesses in the best way that they can. Um, so that's why um, the decision to allow outdoor dining, even in counties like Multnomah, is made as we move through the winter. Thank you, Wright. We'll go next to Lisa Balick with COIN. Uh, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, uh, I have a question also just to follow to Dr. Seidlinger, just to make it clear on the outdoor dining, I guess, we're still trying to figure out why all of a sudden now it's okay when it wasn't, especially with dining operations having four sides atop and essentially a confined environment. Oh, okay, thank Lisa. you for that question. Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead Dr. Seidlinger, it's fine. Um, 
when when um, the governor announced the freeze, this was something that went into effect across the county as a way of us trying to um, drive home the importance of staying home, limiting our activities so we could get this virus under control. We know that freeze won't last forever. And in fact, for most counties, it's coming to an end next week. So this framework presents options for us going forward throughout the winter. As I stated before, outdoor dining was a very difficult decision. And we still recommend takeout delivery and other ways of patronizing those restaurants that do lower your risk. Um, but for um, providing an option for outdoor dining is very important. Some of the structures you see don't follow the guidance that we have out there. Outdoor dining means outdoor dining, even through a cold and rainy um, Oregon winter. Um, yes, having a roof to protect us from the rain, having heaters um, to provide some warmth while we're eating are important but keeping at least three sides or at least 75% of the sides open is what provides that circulation that makes outdoor dining safer than indoor dining. For enclosed structures, whether they're tents or buildings, those don't offer any more protection and in fact are probably more poorly ventilated than indoors and can, can promote the spread. So we'll, we'll be working with our partners across the state, both from a regulatory standpoint as well as our partners in the restaurant industry to make sure that they understand the guidelines and can um, provide outdoor dining options to their patrons with the lowest risk possible. And certainly um, we wanna make sure that those structures don't make it riskier to eat outdoors than it even would be indoors. Governor Brown. Thank you, Dr. Seidlinger. I'll just add, uh, Lisa, we've been working on the new metrics uh, for a number of weeks now. Um, the reason why we updated the metrics is that we wanted to make sure that we were following uh, the latest science and data. We wanted to make sure um, that they were sustainable. Um, as uh, the two doctors and Director Allen have said, uh, we're likely to be in this place for several months uh, until we can uh, complete uh, vaccinations for all that want them. Um, and the third piece is we want to make sure that the new metrics are in alignment with our school metrics. Um, I put the freeze in place because uh, we were seeing an incredible uh, extreme increase in the number of cases. And we have over 50% of our cases across the state um, cannot be traced to a single source. My goal in implementing the freeze uh, was to reduce the spread of the virus and slow the transmission um, and keep Oregonians safe. Um, this is not a place that we can sustain for a long period of time. And uh, our plan is to roll into the new metrics uh, next week. Thank you, Lisa. We'll go next to Les Sites with the Malheur Enterprise. Go ahead, Les. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, the doctors and you have uh, referred to the strain on Oregon's hospitals, and we have seen instances where hospitals are actually full. What are you prepared to do as governor with the instruments of state government to take action if indeed these hospitals do become overwhelmed? Well, Les, I believe that access to health care is a human right and that all Oregonians uh, should have access. We know that was a challenge this spring when I uh, prohibited uh, non-emergent and elective surgeries in order to preserve personal protective equipment for our doctors and our nurses and our physicians assistants providing uh, health care uh, to Oregonians. Um, some Oregon hospitals, particularly in the Portland metro area, are already doing that uh, to make sure that they can preserve hospital bed capacity. Um, honestly, I, I'm committed to providing both uh, financial resources and tools that I have access to to make sure that our medical system has uh, the tools and the resources uh, that they need to provide care to Oregonians. But I'm gonna let Dr. David Jones talk about the challenge we have is around our healthcare staff. Um, this workforce has been stretched thin for the last 10 months. They've been working day and night to provide healthcare to vulnerable Oregonians. We have hot spots, you know, all around the state of Oregon, uh, Idaho, uh, Washington, 
uh, Northern California, and they too are stretched thin. It's not like we can call up uh, healthcare workers in other states to come here because the need is so dire in just about every uh, state across the country, particularly in the Midwest. Dr. Zonis, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Governor Brown. And it's a really important question. And so back in the spring, we, uh, both our system and all of the systems in the region um, collaborated to, to develop a surge plan. And we do have surge plans in place. And, you know, we thought we were fairly, um, you know, a, a bit lucky getting through by flattening the curve because of our social responsibility back in the spring and summer. And now that we're in this third wave, we have, re, you know, dusted off those plans. And we do have active surge plans in order to plus up with the beds. But just as Governor Brown stated, it's now maybe not such a bed problem, but those beds have to be staffed by nurses and physicians. And because we are seeing um, the, the numbers rise and the ability to care for them, we, many of our systems, including ours, are dialing back on the elective cases that require particular types of beds so that we have the capacity in place in order to be prepared for a surge of patients. We are flexing up by taking physicians and nurses from other areas and moving them into the critical units that will be required um, should, those, uh, uh, should the surge occur. Yeah, I think it's really important though that we make certain that the patients, that the right patients are in the right place and at the right time. And so this is a stressful situation. And just as the governor said, the problem in the fall now is that it's not like we can just pull nurses or traveling nurses from different parts of the country because everyone is feeling this. And so we are trying to keep each other safe, make certain that the risk is minimized among healthcare workers. And the best way to do that is to prevent it in the first place. And that is to uh, do all of the measures that we just discussed over the last hour so that you don't have to be, become a patient in our hospital. Thanks, Les. We'll go next to Dirk Vanderhart with OPB. Go ahead, Dirk. Thank you. Um, my question is for Director Allen. I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about um, uh, the vaccines that we are anticipating next month. When are you anticipating getting those? How many doses? And, and what needs to happen before we know for sure that, um, that those are going to be able to be used? Well, my understanding right now is that uh, uh, none of the vaccines have formally submitted for an emergency use authorization, but that that's anticipated. Uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, I believe Monday. Uh, and FDA has committed to a quick and transparent turnaround on its review. They've uh, uh, committed, for instance, to posting the, uh, the uh, original documentation online while it's being reviewed. That'll enable uh, uh, the review process that we, Washington, California, and Nevada are engaging in to occur at the same time uh, as, we, uh, as we look at it so that we can all provide a measure of assurance to the public about safety and efficacy of the vaccine. We anticipate um, receiving something on the order of 30,000, uh, uh, the ability to vaccinate 30,000 people uh, later in the month of December, uh, and then continue to receive uh, uh, shipments of vaccine uh, at an increasing rate, particularly if the other two vaccines that seem to be headed toward approval come online. Those numbers are much less clear uh, right now, but we expect to, uh, to learn more about that um, uh, in the coming weeks. Would be coming from the federal sure. government? I'm sorry. Sorry. Or would those be coming from the federal government? The vaccines? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The federal government will be shipping vaccine directly to uh, uh, certain uh, recipients like long-term care facilities. Uh, and then we will receive a uh, vaccine that will uh, then be distributed uh, uh, to different parts of the state, depending on, um, uh, on the populations that we're trying to vaccine, uh, vaccinate. The first vaccinations will go uh, to frontline healthcare workers who are in contact with, uh, with coronavirus patients. Thank you. Thanks, Dirk. We'll go next to Mike Zacchino with KDRV. Go ahead, Mike. Hi. Um, through all of these measures, um, school metrics have not been impacted at all. And I'm just wondering, it, it seems a, a bit out of place to have limited in-person instruction of up to 20 students per classroom for two hours a day, even in a red zone like uh, Jackson County where Medford has currently 29 or has had 29 cases amongst its staff and five amongst students. So is at what point might uh, limited in-person instruction be 
dialed back so teachers, you know, could potentially work from home and not have to be in a classroom with students. So, Mike, uh, I am focused on making sure that we get our children back into the classroom as quickly as possible. We know that comprehensive distance learning is really, really challenging for a lot of kids, um, particularly for our younger kids. Um, but I know from hearing from my uh, students on the Healthy Schools Reopening Council that for high school students, uh, comprehensive distance learning is challenging, not only from an educational standpoint, but from a social and emotional one as well. We also wanna make sure that our students, our teachers and our professional staff are safe. Uh, and that's why we uh, moved forward with the metrics uh, that we are moving forward with next week, because we wanna focus on getting our children uh, back into the classroom safely. Mm, Dr. Seidlinger, do you wanna talk about uh, the health concerns and the issues uh, in terms of the classroom? Yes, thank you, Governor Brown. I think um, what we know about schools, as you mentioned, you know, cases that were um, amongst staff and students um, that were associated with schools. And what we've seen as schools have reopened to in-person instruction is that yes, as case um, rates and communities have gone up, we've seen more staff or students who attend school who are diagnosed with COVID-19. What we haven't seen is an increase in spread within those schools. The safety guidance we have in place in Ready Schools Safe Learners um, that isolates those cases and quarantines those who are there potentially contacts, who are potential contacts, has limited the spread within school. So those individuals who come to school got that disease in the community and we're able to um, stop the spread of that disease with the guidance we have in place. So yes, as cases go up in the community, we are seeing more cases and that can impact students and staff participating in limited in-person instruction. But that limited in-person instruction is designed for small groups and limited time to provide some teaching um, in person that can't be accomplished as well with comprehensive distance learning. As cases rise, um, we encourage conversations between schools and local public health and state public health to determine if a move to comprehensive distance learning, including eliminating limited in-person instruction is prudent or if those cases can continue because of the extreme benefit of having those students in front of talented teachers and the measures we have in place to lower risk to provide for the safety of the students and staff that are on that campus in very small numbers and limited cohort sizes. Thanks, Mike. Uh, just a reminder for the reporters on the line, if you can uh, use the raise your hand function under the participants tab to get in line to ask a question. We'll go next to Imi Green with the Oregonian. Go ahead, Imi. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, on November 13th, Governor, when you announced the two-week freeze, Oregon was averaging 900 cases a day. Today, it's averaging, averaging 1,200 cases a day. So why are you loosening many of the restrictions when the crisis has only worsened? What would you say to critics who believe that you're bending to industry industry pressure by loosening the restrictions. And I do have a follow-up question. Thank you. Look, um, as I said earlier, my goal here is to protect the health and safety of Oregonians across the state. What we know is, is that um, there is a large portion of community spread in most communities across Oregon. But Oregon is um, very geographically diverse and from a population perspective, we have communities of fairly high density and communities of fairly low density. Um, there's counties like Wallawa County um, that have very few people, frankly. Um, Commissioner Roberts there likes to say, oh, we like to stay further than six feet, of, feet apart from uh, most of our community residents. So we have this um, very diverse geographic and population base, and we've got communities where there's minimal amount of spread. Um, a one size fits all approach uh, did not make sense moving forward. It is a, not a sustainable place for Oregon to be in. I'm in the business of uh, frankly uh, saving lives, but also preserving livelihoods. 
And moving forward with these metrics, what we are trying to do is balance uh, those two things, uh, move forward with activities like personal services that require very rigid safety protocol where we know we can keep people safe, limiting access uh, where activities are less safe. For example, in the extreme risks, uh, gym, gyms and recreational facilities indoors are still closed. And then moving to outdoor dining under limited circumstances um, so that folks can go out to eat in uh, very small groups. Um, so again, it's gonna be for the long haul. It's not for the short haul. Um, I know it's really hard for Oregonians to make these sacrifices. I know it's tremendously hard uh, for our businesses, both large and small across the state, but we know we need to do this in order to slow the spread of the disease and reduce the transmission, preserve our hospital bed capacity, and, and ensure that we have adequate healthcare workers uh, to protect us in the event we get sick from COVID, uh, suffer a devastating illness, or are in an accident. Uh, yes, thank you. So the follow-up question, like in Multnomah County, the restrictions are also going to be loosened by and large. So are you saying that this is an acknowledgement that the two week freeze, or I guess it would have been a four week freeze in Multnomah County was not sustainable, Those the stringentness of those restrictions? Look, we knew that uh, the fr freeze was not sustainable. It was not designed to last over the long haul. As I said earlier, we had been in process of developing these metrics. Uh, there are only a couple of circumstances of my very minor changes uh, in terms of the freeze uh, to the extreme risk. Um, our goal, again, is to uh, make sure that Oregonians are safe uh, to continue to go about uh, their lives and to continue to reduce the spread and slow the transmission of the disease. Dr. Seidlinger, do you wanna follow up? Sure, thank you, Governor Brown. I think as the governor stated, when we went into the freeze, it was very clear that this was a temporary solution that as cases rose and that we would come out of the freeze into some new kind of risk level assessment that would help us get through the winter until the vaccine is readily available. The changes that were made between extreme risk and, and the freeze criteria um, did open up some additional activities um, with measures in place to try and reduce the risk by lowering the gathering size and, and lowering party size, for example, in um, outdoor dining facilities. Other measures are more stringent with um, increase or decreased capacity on retail establishments because we know that these are things that are gonna be in place for the counties with the highest spread um, over some time. But it gives counties, the individuals in those counties, some information about the steps they need to do to protect themselves, which are gonna remain the same, wearing our masks, um, keeping our distance from others and gathering small to what businesses can expect. Um, right now, as they come out of the freeze, if they're in extreme risk, or um, as cases go down, which activities will be allowed, again, to try and keep risk down, but as disease rates in communities go down, allowing some more of those activities to take place. It doesn't mean things are back to normal. It doesn't mean that we get a free pass to do whatever we want. It doesn't mean um, that you know when we get to green that everything is good. There are still restrictions there and until the, um, the vaccine can help us combat this virus, these are the tools we have to combat the virus. And yes, these measures of in the freeze take some time to take hold. And so we've continued to see cases, but we hope in the coming weeks, we'll see those level off. And as people heed the, the guidance, heed the regulations that we'll see a decrease in cases. We worry about Thanksgiving tomorrow with the tremendous pull to get together with families. Um, but we hope people are really gonna do that in a way that lowers their risk, in a way that doesn't put their relatives and loved ones at risk for going to the hospital and in a way that doesn't mean we see a spike in deaths before the end of the year holidays, um, because that would be tragic if the next time families need to get together is to bury a loved one. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. We'll go next to, we have time for just a few more questions. So we'll go next to Bryce Dole with the uh, East Oregonian. Go ahead, Bryce. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is for Dr. Uh, David Zonis. Uh, I, I was told by public health officials that uh, hospitals here in Umatilla County and other East Oregon counties, which uh, will typically transfer patients to you know large hospitals like OHSU for better or more specific treatment, that they're concerned that some of these hospitals might not be able to do that just because of the uh, capacity issues caused by the spike in cases. Um, can you confirm if this is or is not happening currently or or is this kind of just like another concern that's on the horizon? And if it is happening, like what do you, what, what needs to be done to ensure that everyone receives ample treatment? Yeah, Th thank you. It's, a, it's an important question. And so I, I would say that at this point, we, it, is a, it is a concern. Uh, as I previously mentioned in a different question, uh, there is a surge plan and the state is, um, is distributed through um, various regions, regional hospitals. And one of the, I suppose, silver linings that has come out of this pandemic is that multiple hospital systems have met regularly and have collaborated so that we're treating it as one large system where we can identify open beds availability, so both capability and capacity so that we can place patients who are ill in any of those beds. And we have an ability to see this across the entire state. The um, number of beds though are limited in general. At this point, we have an ability to care for everyone who needs our help. But um, as Governor Brown previously mentioned, the staffing issue is a very real one. And so we are currently not in that position where we would be turning away uh, care for patients who need higher levels of care, specifically in you know hospitals and say in the metropolitan area that have um, more spe specialty services available, more ICUs that can be staffed but it is a concern that um, we are all working through right now. I could add to that, Bryce. I think you ended your question with the exact absolute right question, which is what needs to be done to ensure people have access to adequate care. And what needs to be done is every Oregonian in every part of the state, no matter how rural or urban or suburban, uh, needs to do the things that we've been talking about, limit the size of holiday gatherings, limit the number of households, um, wash hands, cover coughs, uh, wear a mask, all these things that we've you know, been talking about for months now. People need to do that everywhere because these hospital systems are connected to each other uh, in an inter interdependent web. And so the fact that your local hospital may not seem to be full doesn't necessarily mean that there's not somebody in that hospital that needs to be transferred to Portland or Boise or, or Tri-Cities or something like that for, uh, for a more advanced level of care. So what needs to be done is all Oregonians really need to do their part uh, to keep people out of the hospital. Thanks, Bryce. Uh, we have time for just one more question. So we're going to go to Alex Zielinski with the Portland Mercury. Go ahead, Alex. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned that the federal government is expected to ship 30,000 vaccines to the state in, in December. Uh, does, that does that number include or, or exclude the vaccines you said were gonna be directly sent to long-term care facilities? Yeah, thanks. And just to be clear, it's uh, enough uh, enough to vaccinate 30,000 uh, 30, people. Um, uh, it's not clear to us yet, in fact, what the math is on that. We, uh, we've been having ongoing conversations uh, as recently as yesterday. I was on the phone with General Perna, who runs uh, Operation Warp Speed, and there's there's still a lot of lack of clarity. And so I can't answer that question with uh, with specificity. What I do know um, is the, the amount of vaccine that will come out uh, initially will, will not be as much as we'd like it to be, but that it appears that things are poised for that number to ramp up fairly rapidly, particularly if there are multiple vaccines uh, available to distribute. And Alex, just to give you a perspective, uh, Pat mentioned roughly 30,000 vaccines uh, for December. Our top priority will be going, uh, we'll ensure that the vaccines go to our uh, healthcare workforce, particularly those caring for uh, COVID patients. Um, but our healthcare worker uh, workforce is roughly 300,000 folks. So you can see that um, we're a long ways off from getting the number of vaccines that we need uh, to vaccinate our uh, entire population. And then secondly, um, both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are two doses. Um, so we would get a first uh, batch in December and then a rolling batch hopefully in January. All of those folks that got the initial vaccine in December would then need to be vaccinated again. So um, it will take some time 
Um, the good news is um, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. I want to close out by thanking Oregonians for making these tremendous sacrifices to keep your friends and family safe this holiday season, also to protect yourself. I know it's really, really hard, uh, but please stay safe uh, this holiday weekend in hopes that we can celebrate a wild and raucous uh, Thanksgiving in 2021. Take care.